Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar of the Jacques Delors Institute. Uh, today, we're going to tackle, obviously, the topic of the moment, which is the COVID-19 crisis. But we're going to do that through uh, a new angle uh, to present some of the work we've been doing at the Jacques Delors Institute over the past uh, few weeks and some of the work we are currently doing and that will be out uh, also in the, in the coming two weeks. Um, so today we're going to talk about the COVID-19 crisis um, using the plural uh, uh, tense uh, here. There is indeed a health crisis, but also an economic uh, crisis uh, that currently uh, uh, Europe is, is facing. And today we're going to try to, to see uh, what is the situation today uh, in, uh, in Europe, especially regarding the economy. Uh, and we're going to look at what can be done in a way that would stimulate the economy while also putting Europe on the right path uh, in terms of transformation of its economy to become uh, pollution free, to become climate neutral. In other words, uh, to build a, a better Europe, a Europe that uh, can also uh, promote its, uh, its values as well as the environmental conditions uh, in, uh, in, in Europe. To do that, uh, we are going to have four uh, key, uh, key speakers, uh, all of them from uh, uh, the different sister organizations of the, of the Jacques Delors Institute. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Nils Redeker uh, will talk to us from Berlin uh, to tell us what is the situation of the economy today in Europe and what has been so far the, the reaction of the member states of the national governments within the, uh, the European Union. Uh, then we are going to move to Geneviève Pons, who will talk to us from Brussels, and she will tell us one, why, in her view, the European Green Deal and the issue of the green transition remains very much a key element, a priority for, for the European Union. Uh, and then we are going to, uh, to move to uh, here in Paris, uh, so first, I'll be happy to, to take the floor and talk about the different phases uh, and the timing of what could be uh, a positive reaction on the side of the uh, European Union to boost the economy while also saving lives and while also transforming our society uh, for the better. Uh, and then I'll give the floor to my colleague, uh, Emily Magdalmiski, also speaking from Paris, uh, who will present some of the latest work we've been, uh, we've been doing on uh, what is now called in, uh, in the EU debate, the, the green recovery. So how can the economy recover while becoming more green? Uh, and in the end, we should have around 20 minutes for question and, and answers with, uh, with you guys. Uh, and this would be moderated by uh, Mathieu Meunier, my, my colleague that I do thank uh, for, having, uh, uh, for having been very helpful in organizing this, uh, this webinar. Um, so let's dive in. Uh, let's start uh, now with, uh, with, with Niels. Uh, Niels, can you tell us what is currently the, uh, the state of the economy uh, in Europe? Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much um, for, for the opportunity to, to be here and, and, and talk to you all. And what I'm going to do today is look at what member states are currently doing to mitigate the economic damage done by the crisis um, and also um, look at what we can learn from what is currently done uh, for the European level. And before I start with the main uh, talk, uh, let me briefly summarize the three main messages I want to convey today. Um, the first is that even though we know the current crisis is a symmetric crisis, it will have very asymmetric effects. That means that some member states are going to be hit much harder economically than others. Second, if we look into the first fiscal responses of different member states, then they don't match these vulnerabilities. This is not the case that member states that are especially vulnerable to the economic consequences are currently doing more to uh, mitigate the economic damage. And, and finally, this doesn't mm, hinge on the fact that these countries don't want to do more, but mainly because different member states have entered the crisis in very different macroeconomic contexts, which now severely limits their fiscal capacities and which we think calls for some European fiscal burden sharing. I will talk a bit about how uh, this, this could look like. Um, so let's start going right into it. Um, 
the, the uh, different uh, consequences across member states. So we all know it's a symmetric crisis. No member state is going to be able to escape some economic damages done by this crisis. Um, but we also have reasons to believe, th believe that these effects are going to be different. Um, I'm just going to give two examples. First, we know that different sectors are affected differently by this crisis, right? It's very obvious that tourism is going to be suffering much more than others. The same for hospitality and um, some transport sectors and a lot of services that rely on direct personal interactions. Um, these uh, sectors are not going to be hit harder by containment measures right now, but they also will take much longer to recover. And unfortunately, some member states rely on these sectors much more than others. And um, this is what you see on the left-hand side. For example, in Greece, these kinds of sectors are more than 30% of total employment. Uh, they're very important in, in, in Spain, in Italy, and much less so in the more export-oriented uh, economies in the north. Another the fact is uh, business demography. We know from previous crises that especially small firms have a hard time weathering such crises. They have less turnover, they have less capital revenue uh, uh, reserves. That means they run into liquidity and solvency problems quite quickly. And again, these kinds of firms are of different importance to different member states. For example, in Italy, more than 60% of all jobs are in firms with less than 50 employees. And this means that these kind of countries um, have a much, much higher risk of running into lots of bankruptcies and long-term uh, damage done by the crisis. We can look at other sectors too and other factors as well, but the main message stays the same. It's a symmetric crisis, but it will have very asymmetric economic consequences across member states. Now, if we look into the fiscal responses undertaken so far, what are member states doing to mitigate the crisis um, on the next slide? Um, and we see a lot of variation. What we see here is on the left-hand side, liquidity measures. These are things like um, public uh, guarantees for loans in the private sector, tax deferrals, and so on. And on the right-hand side, we see direct fiscal transfers all kinds of measures, including um, short-term unemployment, uh, short-term work programs, uh, tax cuts, uh, direct transfers and grants to hit companies. And if we focus on the right-hand side, because it's a bit easier to compare things here, we see it, there's a huge a lot of variation, right? Germany is doing, for example, has spent more than 4.5% of its GDP on mitigation measures. If we look into Spain, on the other side, then it's less than 1% uh, of GDP. So there's a lot of variation. And if you remember the last segment, then you already see that these don't really match the vulnerabilities. Um, if we see this more systematically on the next slides, uh, here. So on the y-axis here, you see our um, different measures of vulnerabilities. Um, and on the x-axis, you see um, how much countries have spent so far. And you see there's no very uh, relation, right? It's not the case that member states are especially exposed to the current crisis, are currently doing more fiscally to mitigate the economic harm. If anything, they're even doing less, if you see that um, on the small company side. Um, so that means that uh, if it stays like this, that, uh, we, 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 see, we will see a lot of divergence, right? Those member states that are currently doing less and are hit hard um, are going to have a harder time getting out of this. So why is it? Why aren't countries like Italy and Spain doing more? Um, are they just, do they just don't want to do more? Um, unfortunately not. I think the, the simple answer is that uh, they can't. Um, if you go on to the next slide, uh, we see that different member states have um, entered the crisis in very different macroeconomic conditions. On the, on the y-axis here, you see again our measures for vulnerability, and on the x-axis, you see unemployment rate in 2019 and the debt to GDP ratio in 2019. And the, uh, the important uh, part here is that a lot of the, the, the countries that we currently talk a lot about at the moment uh, are in the unfortunate, uh, unfortunate position of being in the upper right corner. That means they're not just very exposed to the current crisis, but they also have entered the, the, the crisis um, with high unemployment rates and uh, higher debt to GDP ratios. That means that that really limits the fiscal capacities um, the macroeconomic capacities that these uh, countries currently have to uh, get out of this crisis. So 
if we stay in that world, if we don't uh, uh, change much about this, then this will mean that some countries will uh, uh, be weakened much more than others. It's not just a problem for these countries, just not, not just mean that Spain and Italy will have a very hard time to get out again. It also means that divergence occurs, and this can seriously undermine the single market and the European project in general. And um, so this calls for some fiscal burden sharing at the European level. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, I don't want to go into the details of possible instruments. We have a paper uh, by Lukas Gutenberg who looks like, spells out very specifically how such a burden sharing could look like. And we have the debate about the recovery fund in the last day, so we have an idea. But I want to say, and I think what is important for the rest of the discussion is three general principles how such burden sharing could, should look like. The first principle is, should be real money spent. That means on the one hand, it shouldn't be just credit or loan based. We have a lot of instruments right now at the European level that make it easier for governments to go into debt to finance measures. But that would only mean that they have to increase, they take all of that on their balance sheets, they increase their debt levels enormously, and this could run into serious risk in the long run. So we need uh, real uh, spending. The second is we also need real numbers. Uh, we don't, shouldn't uh, go into the, the old habit of doing some number magic where we put in a couple of billions at the European level and then somehow magically we leverage into that into a, a one trillion headline figure. And what we need now is real money to have a macroeconomic impact. And the second principle is it should be redistributed. That means it should be targeted at those countries that are hit hardest by the crisis. And finally, such burden sharing and on the spending side should be aligned. It should be uh, compatible with other policy goals that the European Union has, especially the Green Deal. And where possible, it should also aim to accelerate the transformations that we need to do. And uh, with that, I think I uh, give, up, uh, give over to Geneviève. So, <clears throat> Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks, uh, many thanks to Thomas for having uh, invited me to, to speak to you from Brussels. So I'm heading the last born of the Three Sisters Institute, uh, Europe Jacques Delors. Uh, it is for me the continuation of a very long time collaboration with Jacques Delors, as I was in charge of environment in his cabinet a long time ago, as you can figure out, as I was with him in Rio, and took part to the writing of the white book, which is mentioned in uh, my uh, op-ed that you may have seen. So I will, I will speak about the Green Deal. Uh, first of all, why the Green Deal must be pursued and, and even accelerated, as Neil has just said. And, and second, how to combine the necessary recovery uh, of uh, the economy and the transformation of our model of development. So first of all, why the Green Deal must be pursued? First of all, democracy. It was requested by EU citizens. And that's why Mrs. von der Leyen, faced with the a hemicycle that has been brought by the European elections decided to adopt a, a Green Deal agenda for Europe. And this for many people, including myself, fighting for that for decades, it was a very, very good a surprise, very good news at least. Um, so, first of all, democracy. But second, it is a green growth agenda. So it is not at all in contradiction with the necessity now to recover from an economic point of view. I would like to, to add something which is mentioned in my, in my op-ed and which has struck me from the beginning. There, there are strong links between COVID-19 and preceding sanitary crisis from the beginning of the uh, 2000 and the state of the environment worldwide and especially with urbanization, deforestation and also uh, traffic in endangered species. So this is another reason why 
we should certainly not uh, forget the, our green agenda. So second part, how to combine the necessary recovery and the transformation of our economy. We should combine three criteria when choosing uh, the measures that will be taken. First of all, the capacity to give an economic stimulus to an economy which is very hardly hit. Uh, it's, it is the biggest shock since the Second World War and estimates are not yet uh, 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 totally uh, uh, clear, but it is likely that the European economy will lose 10% uh, in, in terms of uh, GDP. So first criteria, capacity to give a strong economic stimulus now or in the short, very short term. Second, a social criteria. Uh, it's a, there, are, there are a lot of jobs which are at stake in Europe. According to some estimates, it could be as far as 60 million jobs which are at risk in the EU, which means 25% uh, of uh, the total of jobs. So the capacity to create jobs or secure jobs will be absolutely key. And finally, and this is uh, the, the reason why we are here, all of of all of us that the capacity to accelerate the transformation of our model of development towards a greener one. So we are looking for triple wins. And Thomas and Emily will enter into more details. There are sectors that are more prone than others to give this triple win. They will speak about renovation, they will speak about clean mobility, but I would like to add some words about other sectors. Uh, for instance, circular economy. Right before coming with you to this webinar, I was with the uh, Healthy Ocean Mission Board uh, in the Commission. And there we are looking also for this Green Deal proposal that will be able to relaunch the economy and create jobs. And we find them especially in um, um, water and waste treatment, because it is, it, there is a, a strong need for more installation of collect and water treatment, and it is job intensive, and it is ready to use. So all of this, and it will make our water environment much healthier. So this is an example of triple wins. You have also the new types of tourism. Tourism has been hit very strongly, but there are possibilities to develop rural tourism or sustainable coastal tourism. And this also will mean investments and jobs. And there is also the possibility to accelerate the transformation to agroecology. And there, coming back to the healthy ocean mission, it will diminish our nutrients that go to the water environment. And we will have there also uh, a triple win for the economy, also for employment, but because it is more job intensive, and of course for the environment. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Geneviève. So in, indeed, really here we are coming into uh, the big issue uh, of, uh, of this webinar, which is the intersection between, on the one hand, the economy that Niels talked about uh, and the, the issue of the Green Deal that Geneviève just uh, mentioned. And um, here, as we move to the next slide, uh, I really want to focus on first the issue of the objective. So what should be the European objective during this crisis and out of this crisis. And when we are living in a crisis, there is always a risk on the side of politicians uh, of, uh, let's say, the willingness to what they would usually tell us, getting back to normal. Uh, and we see that in the speeches. One of the reasons is because um, in, in our languages, we tend to lack words. <laughs> uh, and so we use the same expressions over and over again. But 
what I personally fear is that some uh, of those people saying we need to get back to normal actually want to say we need to get back to 2019, uh, to, to, to the society before COVID-19 uh, hit us. Uh, and, uh, and here really the, the problem would be that actually getting back to 2019 would be going, leading us backwards. In a way, we will come back to square one, to a society that is clearly not resilient to a pandemic like COVID-19, which is clearly not resilient to other pandemics uh, that could be even deadlier uh, than COVID-19, but also a society that was uh, and still is today uh, destroying the environmental conditions that make human, human life on Earth possible and that make also uh, the prosperity of the European societies uh, uh, possible. Um, so in our view, really, the objective should not be to get back to 2019. It should be to, to go forward uh, and to build a Europe that after the crisis is cleaner and more resilient than the Europe that entered into uh, the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And I, and I think we need to keep this objective uh, very, uh, very much, uh, very much uh, in mind uh, to ensure that we don't only go from bad to worse, so from, from the bad situation of COVID-19 to a possibly even worse situation with other pandemics or with climate catastrophes, but we actually go from the, the current bad situation where we are to a far better uh, situation where we are more resilient uh, when we pollute uh, less. Um, so once we have this objective in mind, uh, timing is really of the essence. Uh, when you are in a crisis situation, a lot of the mistakes we do is acting too little too late. Uh, it's very difficult to know when to act, uh, especially in, in the current situation, because we face a lot of uncertainties. So here, what we are proposing is very uh, much a, a simplification of three moments uh, in the crisis, uh, keeping in mind, obviously, that there will be overlaps in real life uh, between, between those elements. Uh, the first one is the issue of crisis management, what we do today and in the weeks and months to come. Uh, the second issue that Emily will cover more deeply is about the economic recovery. And the third issue that we cover in the paper but that we won't talk about uh, today uh, is the issue of the fiscal consolidation. Uh, so how do we make sure that we have, um, uh, let's say, a way to deal with the increase of the public debt uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the 2020 decade and in the decades uh, to come. Um, now I just want to take two minutes to really focus on crisis management. What should we do uh, today? What should policymakers do now in order to support people and to support businesses uh, in, the, in the current situation? And obviously, you know, the urgency today is very much a public health urgency. So really the focus is on saving lives. Uh, and what is really key are a, a range of public health measures uh, that we won't talk about today simply because it's not our expertise. Uh, but I just wanted to recall that they're really, you know, the, the, uh, the most urgent uh, policy measures that, uh, that are to be taken and that are uh, to a large extent already being taken. Um, but there is an area uh, that is under the scope of energy and uh, transport policy that very much matters when we talk about public health and that also very much matters in the current situation uh, of COVID-19. And this is the issue of air pollution. Um, air pollution in Europe uh, kills around uh, 370,000 Europeans. Uh, so I just want to repeat the figure. So 370,000 Europeans. Uh, so in a way, we're talking about numbers of deaths that are quite similar to, uh, to COVID-19. Uh, but really the link here is that air pollution is leading to uh, a, a range of diseases, including respiratory diseases, that already today have increased the burden uh, put, uh, put on hospitals because some of the people that are currently in the hospital for non-COVID related reasons are here as a result of chronic air pollution uh, that is resulting from our current energy mobility uh, and agricultural uh, systems. Um, also, I, I want to recall that there have been several uh, studies that have been published over the past few weeks that try to look at the link between air pollution and COVID-19 uh, fatalities. Uh, and what they have highlighted so far is uh, a correlation between those two elements. Uh, 
uh, areas where uh, air pollution is more important are also areas where the number of COVID-19 deaths are more important, uh, but it's too soon to tell whether this is just a correlation or whether this is actually a causality. Uh, so I just wanted to point this out because this means that in a crisis management, if we act under the, the, uh, the precautionary principle, it will make a lot of political sense to try to keep air pollution as low as possible because we know that this will be good in terms of public health. It may be especially good uh, in uh, the situation of COVID-19, but generally speaking, keeping air pollution as low as possible is obviously uh, a, a good thing uh, for, for public health. The second issue linked to uh, the crisis management is really about the economy. Uh, and as Niels pointed out, small companies are especially at risk. And within those small companies, uh, some that are particularly at risk are startups, early stage companies. So those innovative companies that are still small today that have been created one year, two year, three years ago. And those one are really, really much vital to transform our economy in the present and in the future. So, so we think that a specific attention needs to be paid to those startups, to those early stage companies to ensure that they survive this crisis and that, can, that they can play a role in delivering the, uh, the clean solutions uh, in the present and, and in the future. Uh, and finally, when we are saving the company, there have been already billions announced uh, to uh, came to the support of large companies. And here the issue is very different from startups because large companies have existed for decades uh, and they, they have had the time to make a lot of profit, to have reserves, to have good access to capital, good access also to, uh, to policymakers. So here it will make sense to apply strict social and, and environmental conditionality uh, here, but it, it is really at the, at the member state level. So, uh, you know, what Germany does, what France does, where those national governments uh, can and should, in our view, decide to apply tight social and environmental conditionality to ensure that the companies that are helped are also helped to transform and to find uh, a future uh, that is in line with the, uh, the clean energy uh, transformation. So this is really only about the crisis management. Now let's turn to Emily to, to look at what can be done uh, during the, the economic recovery. Well, thank you, Thomas. Uh, so let me get, pick, pick up, sorry, from where you left it. So um, we're in the situation after the crisis. So again, we, I think it's important to remind that we need to be humble here because we don't know when this is going to be and um, what will be the scale of the impact and so yeah, where, where we'll be standing. But, um, here, once we, 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 we went out of this crisis, this uh, first um, mainly health crisis, um, what can we do uh, then to relaunch our economy um, throughout the EU? And so here, um, the EU should really prepare, and the EU and, and the member states should really prepare a coordinated uh, fiscal stimulus to um, not only make the economy recover, but also prepare for, for the future to build a, an economy and a society that is ready for a future crises uh, that are very likely to happen, may they be um, health related or climate related, but it's really the moment to use this fiscal stimulus to um, invest public money in such uh, in areas that really contribute to, 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 to a resilient future. So the question that we can ask ourselves here is what kind of fiscal stimulus should that be? So, um, one of the first question I can ask is how much money should public authorities invest? So this is still complicated to answer at this point, so I won't dig into it, uh, as this will also come with the, with the scale of, 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 of the crisis at that moment. Uh, but I'm really going to dig into the, the second aspect here is where should uh, public money go? And this, um, the third question, how to leave no one behind, is of course part of this, because um, when, we, when we think about where this public money should go, um, it's really important here to articulate two dimensions, which is a quick recovery of the economy to invest this money, but at the same time, as I was saying, um, investing in areas that are really um, contributing to, to, to the future. So uh, this, of course, means um, in, in, in the sector of health, uh, sustainable agriculture, for instance. But here I'm, I'm going to focus on, on, on the areas that I, I know most, uh, which are energy and, and, and mobility. Um, I'm not sure if you can please go to the next slide. Thank you. 
Um, so what you see here is a, is a Venn diagram uh, where you have projects um, on the one hand that um, can provide uh, a macroeconomic stimulus. So for instance, you have projects such as um, building highways or expanding airports. Um, these can provide a very quick stimulus, but the thing is that they do not necessarily contribute to a, to a cleaner future, to a more resilient future, as they contribute to putting more airplanes in the air and more cars on the roads, which can contribute to greenhouse gas, which of course contribute to conquered it means uh, subsidies for for getting rid of all polluting cars and if if you have such uh, money that then goes to to even more polluting cars that can also not contribute to, to such a future on the other hand you have this uh, yellow egg shape um, where you have projects which do contribute to such a future um, and which are very important as well but on the, in the short term they do not provide the fiscal stimulus that is so important here so of course, we still need to finance projects such as offshore wind um, and still keep on investing massively in research. But when we talk about the, the fiscal stimulus, uh, we need projects that really make those two, uh, two circles, two eggs meet. And so you have such projects here in the, in the green area. So for instance, investing in infrastructure that really contributes to a clean energy future, such as um, infrastructure for, for charging electric cars, um, or um, insulating buildings. And here I'm going to focus on, on, this last, um, on this last example, which I think is really important. And we've been talking about it for, for years now, about how important it is to uh, renovate and, and, and make our buildings um, um, uh, uh, much more energy efficient. Um, as it's important, so here it can help for, from, an, uh, from a fiscal stimulus point of view, but when we talk about the, 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 um, a cleaner, more resilient future, this will not only contribute in terms of um, reducing our energy uh, demand and, 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 and of course um, CO2 emissions from it, but we can also make it contribute to um, our daily lives, for instance, and um, currently, we have about 50 million Euro Europeans uh, who, who are in a situation of energy poverty, um, which I imagine is even harder right now with lockdown measures, for instance. Um, so renovating, focusing uh, on the renovation of such building, we can also improve um, daily, the daily conditions of, of many Europeans. And so in the short term, but then if you consider also in the longer term, uh, this will also contribute to, to, to the prosperity of the EU economy. We'll also less rely on, on, on imports of energy, um, making our buildings more efficient. So designing a large scale EU-wide program for uh, such as the renovation wave that has been announced already by the EU Commission, we can really um, uh, contribute with the stimulus uh, investing billions in, in the renovation as it will not only uh, the investment in the in the in the years to come, but will trigger real long-term improvements um, on all those aspects. Um, so I'll leave it here uh, for the green for the green measures uh, that also provide a green stimulus um, at the same time, and give the floor back to Thomas. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Emily. So we are now moving to uh, to the last part of our uh, of um, our webinar, which will be about uh, the question and answer. So I see that there are uh, questions already uh, here. Uh, maybe let, let me give the, the the floor to Mathieu, who will moderate the uh, the, the Q and A now. Okay. So indeed, we already have uh, uh, two questions. So I think I'll take both both in order. So the the first question is. You talk only about fiscal stimulus, but could you discuss how monetary stimulus could help too, please? The role of the European Central Bank, for example. Maybe Niels, you want to answer that question? Sure. Uh, okay, I'm on. Uh, uh, right, perfect. Um, yes. So, so um, I think the, the ECB so far has played a very positive role already, right? We have the, the um, we, we see in the, at the beginning of this crisis that the uh, yields for, for example, um, Italian uh, bonds went up, um, and we were in a moment where we really thought, well, this could end up in like in, in a eurozone crisis scenario, um, 
where, where uh, countries really get under pressure from financial markets. But then the ECB acted quickly and, and provided this PEP program, now um, buying bonds, uh, government bonds on, on markets, and thereby reducing the, the refinancing um, costs of, of member states. And I think this is important. Um, and the, the reason why we, we focus, or I focus on, on fiscal policy, is I think that it won't be enough in, in the medium term, because it comes with the side effect that, of course, the, what the ECB can do at the moment is um, reduce the costs or the interest rates that member states have to pay for going into debt, and this is helpful. Um, but if if all these measures that we ha they have to take now end up on the balance sheets of member states, then especially countries like Italy and Spain will have a huge problem. They will have huge amounts of, of, of debt to GDP ratios. They're already large. They will at a 200 percentage point of GDP level in, in Italy, uh, we have a problem. And then the, the only two scenarios that we could have, if, if this scenario occurs, is either the ECB keeps financing these kind of countries uh, indefinitely, and this would lead to some legal issues under the current framework, um, or we really have to, to, to talk about debt restructuring. Um, and, and again, this is a, a politically a, a difficult road to go down. So uh, I think the ECB and monetary policy is, is, is important to support what member states have to do, but it can't be the only uh, way. It has to be um, complemented by some fiscal stimulus um, that uh, from the European side that really allows to, uh, member states to do something independent of their own debt level. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to ask the, the next, next question for, for Thomas. Um, for building a clean energy future, do you think it's realistic to focus only on renewable energies, which are developing the Chinese business, while we don't have any, we don't have the necessary necessary industrial sector in Europe? So, don't you think that the taxonomy should take in consideration all European sectors which are creating or supporting employment in the EU? Can the future be without EU workers? So. Obviously, the future uh, will not be without uh, EU workers, and one of the uh, elements that is very much central in our in our mind when we are providing those policy recommendations is also the impact this can have on jobs, uh, and this is one of the reasons why the building sector is so important. Um, so here, maybe just a, just a couple of things. First, on the on the renewables, um, most of the renewable energy that we use in Europe is actually uh, made in Europe, so to say. Uh, it's uh, it's biomass, it's hydropower, but it's also wind. Uh, so, for instance, in the in the wind industry, uh, the top companies globally are European companies like uh, the Danish uh, Vestas or like the German Spanish uh, Siemens Gamesa. Um, what is ever true is that Chinese companies do, uh, let's say, are very powerful uh, in uh, producing uh, uh, solar panels. But when you look at the details of when you invest 100 euros to install a solar panel, how much of that is linked to the cost of production of the solar panel, you see that it's actually relatively small. I don't have the right figure uh, here in my mind, so I don't want to say something incorrect, but at least most of the money uh, that, you, uh, that you spend when you install a solar panel goes to something else than just the production of the solar panel, uh, but also you know, the connection of the network, the, the labor, uh, the workers that are installing the, the solar panel. Um, so, and obviously there are a lot of uh, new renewable energies that can be promoted in the uh, in this transition. Uh, for instance, heat pumps, uh, where the uh, European industry is already uh, is already uh, very uh, uh, very good at that. Uh, so here, really, the idea is also to use this green recovery as an element that can build on existing EU industrial policies, uh, having specifically in mind the issue of the uh, European Battery Alliance uh, and how installing charging points can be positive in order to promote uh, battery production uh, in Europe. Uh, but also it's really an opportunity to see how we can um, uh, help the buildings sector uh, to restructure, to find new ways uh, of producing uh, efficient materials, but also of rolling out uh, those kind of renovations uh, all over Europe. Uh, and this will help the industry, the European industry, both at the very local level, uh, because you have a lot of small SMEs uh, that are working to do the actual renovation work on site, uh, but also the big European companies that are producing the energy efficiency materials like double glazing windows, 
uh, etc. So really, in, in our view, uh, the gun recovery can be uh, also, uh, let's say, something positive for uh, a sort of, uh, of forward-looking EU industrial policy. Uh, so the next question is asked by a few participants, and it's about um, uh, the, the classifying of launching new offshore wind projects uh, as a uh, non-macroeconomic uh, uh, stimuli. And maybe, Emily, you want to bounce back on, on that? Yeah, so the, the rationale here to, for placing um, such projects in the, in the yellow area was um, because usually new offshore wind projects take a lot of time to be implemented. So it often takes seven, eight years to actually uh, come to the ground. Uh, so of course we need to still continue uh, implementing such projects, but that's, that's the reason for the classification here. And those that already started ongoing need to, to, to yeah, keep on being implemented. But it was really related to the, to the length of the, of the implementation of these new projects. If I, if I can add, uh, here we really put new offshore wind projects. So we are talking only about the really new ones. So if you want to, uh, for the reason that Emily mentioned, you need a lot of time to, to do that. What however could be done is to increase the size of existing uh, offshore wind projects. So for instance, there are regular national calls that are happening. Uh, so for instance, let's say if uh, Germany is asking for 10 gigawatts of offshore wind, uh, in a specific area, maybe it can decide to go from 10 gigawatt to 11 or 12, or maybe more gigawatts. So, so that could be part of it, but this would be, let's say, rather uh, increasing the, the size of projects that already are uh, uh, in, the, in the pipeline. Um, okay, so the, the next question is uh, quite, quite short. Um, and it also goes back on uh, the topics uh, of uh, one of our previous se seminar. Uh, so it's how best could the EU budget support a clean recovery? Uh, I don't know, Niels, if you want to dive in, into that question uh, very rapidly and maybe. I'm not sure I'm the, the best expert to, to answer this. And uh, we have um, people worked uh, on, the, on this specific question. And uh, maybe tomorrow and me want to join. Well, well it's, a, it's a difficult question for, for us. And uh, uh, had I known that this question would be asked, I would have uh, asked uh, my colleague, Eula Yarubio, uh, who is actually uh, here following the, the webinar uh, to, be, uh, to be a speaker because she would provide a better answer. So it just, I just want to be uh, very short, at least. Um, part, of the, uh, part of the issue for the EU budget is to what is called front load uh, part of the MFF. So in other words, to ensure that we spend more in the coming years, 2021 to maybe 2023, uh, than, uh, than later on. Uh, but then also what, is, uh, what can be uh, interesting within the, uh, within the EU budget um, is um, to, to ensure uh, that significant segments of the EU budget will be made available for uh, for climate, essentially. If you want to focus rather on the clean side of the clean recovery, uh, you need to be sure that uh, a sufficient amount within the EU budget uh, would, be, uh, would be targeting to climate. Uh, thank you. It's, it's not, not an easy question because uh, our budget policy specialists are not, uh, not in this webinar today. Um, so the, the next question concerns uh, biodiversity. Uh, so a, part, a participant says, thanks for your interventions. A link was made between biodiversity losses and the pandemic. Biodiversity was also a part of the Green Deal. Could you provide concrete examples of investments? Uh, sorry, I lost, lost the question there. Uh, so the idea was, could you provide concrete uh, example of um, investments that would go towards uh, saving biodiversity? and still be viable in the current situation. Um, maybe Geneviève, if you want to address that question. Yes, thank you very much. So actually all the examples I have given uh, are going in this direction. Uh, when speaking about uh, agroecology, I speak about uh, diminution of entrance and uh, so uh, making uh, agriculture 
much less harmful for the environment and especially for biodiversity. In Europe, unfortunately, agriculture is the main origin of biodiversity loss. Uh, at a certain moment, when I was heading WWF uh, European office, I could have told you exactly what percentage of birds or fishes uh, have disappeared for either the uh, European uh, air or the European uh, waters. Uh, it's absolutely huge and it's, uh, it's directly linked to the agriculture practices we have had so far. And even many farmers recognize it. Uh, I remember I had some of them in my office telling me the experience they had when they were uh, children and they were going to fish in the rivers uh, near their farms. And uh, now when they go with, with their grandchildren, there is no more fishes uh, in the same waters. So we have, by this mutation to a different uh, kind of farming, we will preserve the uh, European biodiversity. Exactly the same if we, if we have a better collect and uh, sel se selection and recycling of uh, waste, we will avoid a lot of soil and air pollution and we will preserve many species. And finally, with water treatment, it is the same. Uh, when nutrients go into the, the, the water system, they will kill everything on their, uh, on their way. The, the, the worst example in Europe is the Baltic Sea, the state of the Baltic Sea, because of so many nutrients being thrown into the Baltic Sea. So we need to change everything in the way we consume, in the way we produce, and we really would like, uh, it's more than like, we are now pleading for uh, the EU to accelerate the mutation of our economic model of development towards a much more sustainable one and much more uh, uh, um, respectful of nature and biodiversity. Thank you. So the next question um, is about uh, large companies. So how to implement social and environmental conditionality to large companies bailout in practice? So um, in practice, you have many, many ways to do that. And so far, um, uh, countries that have in Europe that have been the most ambitious, at least to my knowledge, uh, and I don't know everything about, about this because it's, a, it's very much an evolving topic, uh, are Denmark and, uh, and, and Austria. Uh, but here, essentially, it really depends on, on the appetite, uh, if I may say so, of the, of the governments. Uh, in, in my view, really, the, the bare minimum, the minimum threshold should be, uh, for, for the social dimension, at least, no layoff of workers. Um, and for the environmental conditionality, the bare minimum would be for those companies to adopt in the next two years a strategy that uh, gives them a future or that tell rather what, it, what is going to be their future in a climate neutral world, uh, which is a topic that is not that challenging for some companies, but that may be very challenging for uh, oil and gas companies uh, or, or airline companies, challenging in the sense that it will uh, oblige all of them uh, to, to think about what is their business model uh, in the transition, in the, in the end, what are those companies going to do in order to make a profit in a climate neutral world. So to me, that, that would really be the bare minimum. Uh, if, if we don't even have that, then it means that we don't have, even have the bare minimum in terms of uh, environmental conditionality. Then obviously, if you have, uh, let's say, uh, more appetite, if you want to go further, uh, then it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, just taking an example on the top of my head, if I, if I can, for oil and gas companies, one interesting indicator is where do they invest money for the future? So, so what are, where do they invest what we call the capex, the capital expenditure? Uh, what we know at the global level is that oil and gas companies invest 
99% of the capex in oil and gas. And they invest less than 1% of the capex in alternative energy, uh, like offshore wind, like uh, geothermal uh, and everything. The, to be fair, the European oil and gas companies are doing a bit better uh, than the Saudis or, or, or the Americans, but nonetheless, even for the European companies, uh, I think is around 5%, but maybe one of the 5% figure. Uh, and here, if national governments want, uh, one of the conditionality that they could impose is, you know, you guys need to have some kind of plan that increases your capex in something else than fossil fuels. Uh, and then obviously it would be up to the company to say whether they, they feel that they, they can uh, make a better business in offshore wind, uh, like for instance, the Danish company uh, Ofsted, which was called Dong Energy before, uh, did, uh, or whether they want to go in other areas where they already have expertise, uh, like deep geothermal, for instance, uh, which is an area where some of the expertise of oil and gas company can be put at the service of a profitable uh, clean transition. Thank you. So the next question is uh, is a bit similar. We're still talking about uh, about companies and jobs. Uh, so uh, this participant is asking, is saying, the European Green Deal implementation won't necessarily contribute to more job security and overall human security for the average European or the average small or medium enterprise in Europe, and more so probably in the south of Europe. Um, is there something you'd want to say to that statement? Well, like, maybe I can quickly react. When, when I was hearing Niels's presentation, I also had in mind the countries where uh, energy efficiency gains can be very beneficial, and also the countries where you have a lot of access to renewables. Uh, and when you see that countries that have been impacted are include countries like Spain and Italy, uh, we know that in Spain and Italy, they tend to have a building stock that is less efficient than uh, countries from, uh, from Northern Europe. So the capacity of having energy efficiency gains is higher uh, in the South and the East of Europe than in the, north, uh, than in the Northwest. Uh, and, and obviously just to knock on an open door, uh, the, the capacity, especially for solar energy, whether it's solar heating or solar electricity, is higher in countries in the south of Europe than, uh, than countries in the north. Uh, so, so you can definitely think uh, of something that um, specifically targets the uh, social and economic benefits of the green transition for those countries in the south of Europe that are particularly hit uh, today uh, in, the, in the crisis. If I just may add, and I think uh, Tomar is totally right, right? There's a lot of win-win uh, situations. I think we also have to be honest in saying, well, we need a broad stimulus that affects all kinds of sectors, especially sectors like uh, uh, that are hit hard by this crisis, and not all of them will like accelerate the the, the, the green the green deal. Um, and that that will, for example, you need probably something like decreasing the VAT in specific sectors to increase uh, people like make, make people go to restaurants again, right? And um, and we need money for that as well. And um, but I think what what has to be the, the guiding principle on these broader issues is just don't make don't do stupid stuff. It has to be that you, okay, don't use European money for clash for clunker, cash for clunker systems and do what the Germans did in 2008 and 9 by just like uh, doing a stimulus, letting everyone buy a new car without any, without any conditionality. So I think it, we, we have to be honest in saying, well, we need a broad recovery that goes beyond just the environmental sector and beyond just anything that can accelerate. We have to identify the parts where we can accelerate and do that. And for the other parts, we have to be careful to select policies that do stimulus without undermining the, 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 uh, the goals of Dr. Green Deal. Uh, so the next, the next question I will ask is, uh, could you provide insights on how agroecology agro will be or should be supported within the Green Deal? Will the European Commission be the sponsor for this transition or has it to be the member states or maybe companies? Okay, uh, that's for me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, first of all, the the first point I would like to make is that uh, it's also a reorientation of the CAP fund, and what I I will propose 
is that 50% uh, of the CAP funds, so something like 20 to 25 uh, billion per year, uh, be devoted to the agroecological transition. Um, there are uh, funds which are managed very often at national level. So it will depend on action that will be taken uh, by uh, national authorities. As far as companies are concerned, um, I think that, unfortunately, for decades, farmers have learned how to cultivate through the businesses that sold them in France. Now, there will be the need, and I think this will be, uh, this, this will have to be made at national level, there will be a need to train or retrain farmers to traditional methods. They will need to relearn what is the normal cycle of different plants in order to shift to uh, agroecology farming, to use less nutrients, to pollute less, and also to spend less. So there, there will be probably, probably is a, a weak word, uh, conflictual interest as far as some companies are concerned. Thank you. Um, so I, I think uh, this might be one of the last, last few questions. Um, so it, it concerns a topic we had in a, in a webinar a few months back, uh, industrial policy. So fiscal incentives, monetary incentives, but what about a new industrial policy to internalize manufacturing productions? I think that's an interesting question because we hear a lot about how we produce uh, here in Europe and uh, what materials we're able to get in high quantities enough for, for people. Right. Um, yeah, I, I can briefly say something on that. Why this is, I, I think, the, the making uh, value chains more more um, reliable should be a goal. Uh, it should be a goal to to make sure that, especially on certain equipment, we have the, the needs that we 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 have the value chains uh, in Europe in order to 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 come up with that. And and of course, the broader idea of of industrial policy is still relevant, right? We still have uh, have to 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 think about ways how to stimulate. Um, uh, productivity in, in, in Europe. We have to think about ways to get industrial um, uh, centers and hubs into places that are um, not, that, uh, not that active yet. But I think uh, we shouldn't make the mistake of now thinking about like um, private leverage, private sector leverage here, right? Uh, so there's a lot of talk about now we, we have to do is like we, we give a bit of money to the EIB and then the EIB hands out to loans uh, to, to, to the private sector for then the private sector to, to, um, to, to end up, you know, especially industrial uh, sector, to, to increase um, output again. And I think the, 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 the concern that I would have is that in this context of such high uncertainty, where it's going to be so difficult uh, to get anyone to spend money. Um, if we channel that through, uh, leverage that through, through, through the bank and, 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 and count on the private sector just driving it on its own, uh, we will end up doing less than we should. Um, so I think industrial policy has a role to play and we should, uh, should uh, keep, um, continue to, to, to have that on our radar. But it's it, it, it's not a moment of, uh, like, this is not going to be a moment of industrial growth uh, by itself. We need to stimulate that with public money. So uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank you all for your, for your questions. Unfortunately, we don't have time to, to answer all of them, but uh, I'll give uh, uh, Thomas back the floor for his uh, conclusion to this webinar. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the speakers and thank you uh, also to, to the more than 100 people that attended here. I just want to give a one minute conclusion of my own personal takeaways from that. Um, so what we, we learned from this seminar is, is first that we have a, a, a symmetric crisis, but this symmetric crisis has asymmetric effects. So countries in Europe are uh, impacted in a different manner. What we also see is that countries' reactions differ 
and the countries that are the hardest hit are not the ones that are acting the more. Uh, one example of that is that Germany is doing more than Spain, even if Spain is more impacted by COVID uh, than, um, uh, than Germany. And the reason is, is because they have some fiscal constraints and, and there is a need uh, to, to deal with this. Uh, but beyond this, we also see that the European Green Deal uh, is key to ensure that we build a better future, that our society at the end of this crisis is a better one, a more resilient one uh, than, than the European society of 2019. Um, so in order to, um, you know, as you say in English, kill two birds with one stone, um, both in the crisis management and in the recovery, uh, policymakers can apply very simple principles. And, and the first one, uh, to use a, a term coming from actually the medical sector, you know, the, the do no harm principle. Uh, or to use uh, the, the words that Niels used, you know, don't do stupid stuff. Uh, so, so don't invest in, in things that would be bad for uh, other policy areas such as uh, the, the, the Green Deal. So first, do no harm. Uh, and then maximize all the win-win situations uh, that do exist. There are some we, we talked about today, like on agroecology, on rolling out charging points for electric vehicles, renovating buildings uh, in Europe. But here we're just scratching the surface. There are many, many, many more projects that can deliver uh, a quick recovery and also a green recovery, the transformation uh, of our society. And, and, and uh, just to tease uh, on what is the ongoing work at the Jacques Delors Institute. Uh, so we are currently working with Genevieve, with Emily, with Niels, uh, so Paris, Berlin and, and Brussels. Uh, and we should come out uh, with a, a paper tackling the issue of the, the green recovery uh, in the in the coming weeks. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, we'll have the the opportunity to uh, to discuss that in uh, into more details in the in the near future to see uh, how we can make the best of the current situation and how we can get out uh, stronger together. Thank you all.